Okay. Can share now? All right. Um, share. Share. No, it still says your screen sharing is paused. No, why is that? Here it is showing like uh, uh, it in yeah. So she has started screen. This is happening here. Yeah, but the message I get is your screen sharing is paused. Uh, let, let me check. Yes, sir. It's, visible, sir. it's getting shared. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, it's visible now. Okay. All right. Great. So fine. Welcome back. And I'm sure the previous session was too full of details, but that is why I this one as well as the one uh, the second session tomorrow will be a little less detail oriented so in this when we talk of <laughs> presentations i'm well right now most presentations or nearly all presentations are online one major difference between uh, online and offline presentation is that uh, in online presentations you have little more flexibility in terms of the legibility of documents. Why? Because many of them are uh, seeing them on their phones. So maybe they're too close to, they're too close to the screen. So it, uh, the letters don't have to be large, but there are minor differences. A few other things, uh, for instance, online present the, the other day i was reading this article that what are three most annoying things that you should not say in online meetings you know which was the top one the top one said you are on mute and the article made a very good suggestion and it said instead of saying you are on mute best things to say that look if you are saying something we can't hear you and that's a far uh, better and reassuring way of putting it rather than saying you are on mute. The second was, uh, we will start in uh, one or two minutes time. That is beyond the scheduled time. Again, I agreed with the article because it said, see, by doing this, you are actually penalizing those who have been punctual. I mean, if you have uh, said that you will start at a certain time, then why do you still need allow more time for people who are maybe not so uh, not so punctual to my mind it adds something else also and this is in a way has something to do with uh, presentations because when you see when you are giving a presentation offline that is when you are giving it on site when you can see your participants who are physically present in front of you then there is again it is important why they whatever you are showing on the screen is legible because those who have chosen to sit closer to the screen by and large it shows that they are more interested in the topic than those who are sitting at the far behind at the at the back you know back benches this is not always true but yes it is very often true then the argument is those people who are sitting farthest from the screen, if we assume that to begin with, they are not terribly interested in your presentation. On top of that, if you are, if they can't read very easily what you are showing on screen, especially a text or even a lot of tables, then they are not just going to sit there idly. They will start, you know, either they will take out their cell phones and start chatting or maybe they will start chatting amongst themselves. And because <coughs> you are facing them, you will see that. And you know that will affect the, your morale. It will affect the uh, effectiveness of your presentation. So all the more reason why you should be take enough care to see that all that you are projecting is absolutely easily legible. So I will devote some part of this uh, session to that. But to, before that, to begin with, we should start with what is the reason you are presenting. 
because if all you need to do is to deliver information then i would say presentation is not really the best way so you need to know why exactly you are presenting then you need to see what you you can do to guarantee that all those who are all those of your audience whether they are sitting far away or whether they are sitting close to the screen it's visible to you and then what should be the way in which you would write the text on your slides so and other things like how you should stand what you should do about your voice how fast or how slowly you should speak and so on lastly how do you take questions how do you handle questions so what you need to remember is when people are reading then it is just the person who is reading and the document whether it is in print whether it is on screen whatever but it's a entirely solitary activity whereas a presentation is a group activity which means you as a presenter is setting the pace now at times the pace will be too slow for some of your audience maybe too fast for some other members of your audience and for some it will be by and large uh, an optimum pace neither too fast not too slow but you can't really make it optimal for across the board but if you have done your homework if you know enough about your audience you will <coughs> your pace will be optimal for most of them so here again i want you to use your um, chat box and just type whether you are watching this on your desktop so you can just type d or desktop or whatever or your laptop in that case again you can type laptop or just l or your phone if you can just type phone or p so you can just do that just put in the chat box it will give me some idea in the meanwhile as i said and this is a quote from somebody who has done a lot of work on presentations it is the worst possible way to deliver information now imagine a situation where you have completed a project or maybe it's your thesis and you are presenting it uh, as as either your defense or to a committee of referees or to your department and so on so if you are presenting uh, you have completed a project and the funding agency the agency that sponsored the project says that well thank you you have sent us a detailed project report but why don't you just come come over and talk to us for say about half an hour or one hour then in that 30 minutes or in that one hour whatever is the allotted time if you want to put in everything that you have put in the report itself you are setting yourself up for failure it's, it's never going to work so i would say that in such situation you should consider your presentation successful if after listening to your presentation many people in the audience go back and actually open your project report and start leafing through it so you have what have you done your presentation has piqued their interest you have got them interested you have got them motivated they want to know what's in your report because they have been alerted to some of its highlights which you have covered in your presentation highlights only whereas all you want to do is to deliver information then why make a presentation then you can might as well you know either send them a print copy or send them burn a disk and send it to them give them a pen drive give them a link and say you can download whatever so presentation is good for getting people interested in your topic to start a discussion or sometimes in the hardest part of a presentation is presentations that are meant to persuade what i'm going to cover here is mostly presentations that are meant either to explain or to inform but if your presentation is meant to persuade then you of course you require a slightly different strategy but that is what you need to be clear about that why are you making this presentation and that you need to know so <laughs> you could be just to get them interested which is always a good way or sometimes especially in recruitment this happens that especially in uh, academia you know you are being selected for a post in the university or you know another iit or so then you are asked to you know why don't you give a seminar to your department now if you are a newbie 
and you are asked to give a seminar to your department which you hope to join then there is not too much that you can tell them in advance or there's not too much that you can tell them which will be new to them yet you are being asked to give a presentation why because they want to judge whether you know enough about your subject to be able to stand in front of an audience and talk coherently for an hour or 45 minutes whatever so that could be another way a reason why you have been asked to present or as i said you are making a presentation to persuade so let's say that you submitted a bid for one of the projects and a few other agencies have also submitted their bids and the agency has called all of them over and you know each one is given 10 minutes to talk then obviously what you want at the end of your presentation is that your the organization that you represent is given the project so that's presentation to persuade so what you need to do is you need to know your audience and you need to know what is it that you want from them so this is typically the objective but the objective needs to be defined in terms of your audience and what you want that audience to do what is the action that you seek so the information that you need about your audience is you know whether it's a large audience if it's a small audience what is their background how old are they and so on because there has to be something of a you know what's the commonality what is it that they share because accordingly you will fix your presentation and what is the response that you seek whether you're explaining some concept whether you're explaining how a uh, some instrument works or what so that's the response so that both you need to uh, define if you are making a good presentation and you also need to know how much time you have so if you let's say you say that i will talk to you over an hour or about an hour and you speak for say 50 minutes or 55 minutes that's fine nobody's going to mind but if you say that or if you have been given an hour and even at the end of one hour you are nowhere near completion you know that's uh, that's a disaster because people will stop listening to you after a while they may allow you a few grace minutes but not really too long so you need to know how much time you have and prepare accordingly you are also see giving a presentation is something that that makes uh, that makes many of us nervous and especially you are nervous because at the beginning so the first minute or the first half a minute you are really nervous and the way to overcome that is preparation so the more thoroughly you are prepared the less nervous you would be and preparation doesn't mean only the contents of your presentation so that is what i am saying that it is also important for you to know the setting what exactly is the occasion so is it a scientific conference it's a project presentation, whether it's a felicitation, whether it could be even a condolence meeting, whatever. Where exactly are you going to make that presentation? Ideally, and so far as it's possible, I would urge you to actually visit the venue in advance. Maybe the previous day, maybe a couple of, maybe an hour before, whatever, it's, whatever is possible. So get to know the venue, the exact venue. See whether you, from the point that, which whether there's a lectern, whether there's a stage, whatever where all the fittings are what sort of assistance you may expect whether you can use your laptop and connect it or it's enough to bring your presentation on a usb drive and then connect it the system will be provided by the organizer whether there'll be a microphone what kind of microphone so all these details are important because then you are prepared See, you want to, to be prepared, you need to eliminate as many surprises as possible. Then you also need to know what is the day and time you are presenting. Are you the only presenter or you are amongst several presenters? Are you going to be presenting before lunch, after lunch? It all makes a difference to the way you present. If it's, as I said, if you are one of the speakers, it helps to know what other speakers are going to be speaking if it's a panel discussion what their views are then the mechanics of that it's like you know because what happens is typically there's as you know there's a downward compatibility so if you have a 
a lower system or lower version and the organizers have a higher version, then that is not a problem. But if it's the other way around, yes, it can present a problem. Even simple thing as, you know, the fonts that you have used for your presentation, I'll touch upon that later. But if you are using system fonts, then again, that's not a problem. If you are <laughs> using customized fonts or fonts for branding, then they may not be available and you need to be prepared for that. So as I said, what sort of hardware, what expectations or what sort of help can you expect? One thing that I have observed, fortunately now this is uh, becoming less and less uh, often that you will have lecturers who will who are making the presentation, but somebody else is actually operating the equipment. So they will keep saying, next slide, next slide. No, that's pretty annoying. It's pretty irritating. You need to know either you get a pointer that allows you to advance your slide or you have a keyboard that you can operate yourself, whatever. So that's, that's important. Even reaching the venue, because at times, especially a large uh, venue, now you take, for instance, now I spent many years in Terry, uh, and eventually moved to India Habitat Center. So whether it's India Habitat Center, whether it's any large you know, hotel, they may have several conference, <coughs> conference rooms or several auditoria. Then within that, you need to know where exactly your presentation is scheduled. Remember, you are already stressed because you have to make a presentation. And on top of that, if you are you know, caught up in traffic, if you're, uh, you know, uh, late, then already you're flustered. And then you find out that you don't know where exactly. Yes, it said such and such hall, but where exactly is that hall? So eliminate all these surprises. Online presentation also. Now I'm giving you a presentation online, obviously, but I mentioned to your organizers early on that look, today is Saturday, especially we may have uh, outages, you know, the power failures. We have a backup, but sometimes the mine is a BSNL connection at the their uh, server room or whatever that is, there may not be power. So what I have done is, although I'm using a desktop, I have also kept a laptop ready, which has, which uses another uh, broadband connection. So in case something happens, I have a backup. Sometimes even that fails, but that's an eventuality. So you need to also be prepared with, or, or take a uh, even a more important example. When we started, because your organizers in uh, their wisdom said that although we are starting at 11 o'clock, it's best that we have a trial session at 10.30. So at 10.30, I logged in. In fact, first I was not able to <laughs> log in. So we have some uh, had some back and forth. At the same time, my uh, landline stopped working. I hardly ever use a cell phone. So all that happened. Anyway, we could get through. Then I found that uh, I was not audible to the organizers. Now I have recently had switched because I don't really prefer wearing the uh, headset. So I had uh, tried a caller mic and a previous uh, Zoom meeting I had, it worked. But today for some reason, it didn't work. So then I had to pull out that, use the headset and so on. So what I'm saying is that, yes, you need to be prepared for such eventualities. So that is why it's also important that, <coughs> that you need to rehearse. So you may be given a certain time and you can't always wing it. You say, okay, we have 10 minutes. I know roughly how long it takes, but unless you have made at least one rehearsal, then you know how long it you actually take. And that needs to be, uh, needs to fit in the presentation. Now, in fact, when, uh, See, I typically when I offer these training programs, I have one session on numbers, another session on tables. But here, because we uh, didn't have that much time, so I had to combine this. So that means I need to, I needed to open that presentation, remove some of the slides. Then I need to needed to go on the web, find out some papers from your institute, and as far as possible, take examples from those and so on. So it it all helps, that's that's what I'm getting at. So as I said, it is important that whatever that you project on the screen is clearly visible and easily visible. So these are the seven parameters, seven variables over which you have control. So you need to, the size of the letters that you use, it needs to be large, they need to be built separated, good color contrast, 
and so on so these are essentially the last is essentially i mean you unless you observe the first six then the challenge is to restrict the amount of text so we'll come to that in a minute so we'll start by uh, saying how large is large so uh, if i ask you that if you use a font which is let's say 32 point font so what exactly does that mean when i say that um, the length of this pen is uh, 8 cm so you know exactly what i am talking about but if i say this font is 32 points what do you understand by that even if i tell you that uh, one point is roughly a third of a millimeter 0.35 millimeters to be exact even then what is it that we are measuring so we'll come to that so here's now because uh, let me see uh, your chat response uh, p is phone yeah okay so we have a fair mix but yeah phone laptop desktop but especially with phone it may not be as much of a problem so if all of you can see very easily the first line make all text very large but you can see for yourself how as you increase the font size it becomes easier for you to take in what's uh, what's been shown on the screen it depends on what is the distance between whatever the surface that you are reading from and your eye so typically a reading distance is about um, 25 to 30 centimeters but it could vary in a large hall of course it's not but whereas a cell phone it could be something like five or six centimeters so it depends so to get back to my question what is font size think of it this way that font size refers to the height of the frame and not height of the picture which means that although the frame is large the picture may be small or large the picture may fill almost all of the frame or it may not fill all of the frame but notionally the font size will be same so let me illustrate this so the same word appears three times i have not changed the font size but i have changed the typeface so as you could see that all of it is in 96 points but that is the notional or nominal point size 96 but what is the actual point size as you could see the third one is much larger than the first one why is that it's because the first one at the uh, is typed in garamon garamon is a typeface which is essentially a document typeface it's not meant for posters or presentations whereas vardana that's the last one vardana is really quite large so vardana 96 points is much larger than garamon 96 points with times new roman or sitka text that i'm using somewhere in between so what is the font size it is the height so that means it is the height of any actual letter plus a little bit of space above and a little bit of space below that is what i mean when i say that it is the frame and not the picture so that's the first thing that you should make it large then what's the second thing of legibility is how much space there is between lines so there should be enough space between lines so i am simply saying 57 points <coughs> you can try out different uh, because it also depends on the typeface that you have chosen and ascenders and descenders so these are these uh, three groups of letters so e n o r x is one group b f h k l is another group and g j p q y is a third group why have i grouped in these why are e n o r x together because they have neither ascenders nor descenders whereas the second group b f h k l you see they have what we call ascenders that is they are parts of the letter that are going up and g j p q y have descenders that is they are parts of letters that descend below the baseline so if your line spacing is too close then 
the descenders of the line above may clash with the ascenders of the line below. So that is why it is important that you have a comfortable line spacing. There's another reason why I suggest good line spacing, larger line spacing, because that way you are putting less text on the line. So the see before any before anyone starts reading what you are projecting, first of course they will get their first impression, maybe a few milliseconds. So if that first impression is that too much text, they may not even bother to start reading. Whereas if you have enough space between lines, automatically you are restricting the amount of text you have put on any one slide. So be careful with that. Then there is the question of contrast. Again, if you are close to the screen, this line shouldn't be difficult for you to read. But if the contrast is clear, then it's so much easier to read. So what I've done is the first one, the first line, I have reduced the contrast because I am using 15% gray as a background because it's not too bright. And letters I have used 25% gray instead of black. And you can see the contrast has come down. Whereas yellow on black or yellow on dark blue is a very legible combination. So if you have chosen light gray as a background, it depends. You can choose light gray, you can choose light blue, whatever. But it's better to choose a uh, pale background rather than just white, because white sometimes come across as too bright, especially in if you are giving an on-site presentation, because these days the projectors, uh, the lights are really quite powerful. That was not the case earlier. So it uh, causes a lot of dazzle. So it's best that you use a muted background. Now, some colors stand well against the background that I have chosen, like gray. If I have chosen a gray background, then orange, green, purple, light blue, they all stand out quite clearly. But what happens if you have, if you need more color? Let's say that you are showing um, the power consumption over a 24 hour period in different cities. You, know, you are uh, matching, uh, you are recording electricity consumption over a 24 hour cycle. So, you know, typically there will be a bimodal peak. And then of course at night as the evening wears on, the consumption will be less. And you are doing it say for four cities. So you, you have chosen these four colors, that's fine. But <coughs> if your data have, if you have data for seven or eight cities, then what would you do? So then I would suggest that instead of going only by color to differentiate among the different cities in this example, I would suggest that you introduce some other parameter, like you can use a solid line. So let's say a solid green line represents one city, but a broken green line represents another. So you could use something else because the more colors that you choose, the more it's likely that any one pair will have inadequate contrast between the two. You see how it works. Now that the label here is in white, but you can see when the background is yellow, it is almost invisible. Whereas the background is blue or violet, then it is even dark green works well, but so there's a difference in contrast. So you should choose your slide color scheme such that it gives a good contrast between the background and the foreground. That is also a requirement of legibility. So not only your text should be large, not only you should have enough space between lines, but you should also choose good color contrast. And there are ways of doing this. There is a good website. In fact, I recommend this website to you if you are uh, <clears throat> giving, if you're interested in becoming a better presenter, think outside the slide. So Dave Paradi, who runs this slide. So he offers this, uh, calculator. So you can go on to this side and check the calculator and you split the RGB values, red, green, and blue for the background and foreground. And then you see how it works. So there are different values and the brightness contrast should be at least 125. That is the difference between and the color difference. So you can try it out yourself. The fourth requirement is that the lines that you present, they need to be fairly thick. Now, 
the previous session, somebody asked me about the lines that we use in tables. So I suggested you could use one point thick line at the top of the table. You can use half a line thick, which is uh, at the bottom of the column headings. And you can use one and a half thick line at the end of the table, or you could use a double line. Or take the figures that you prepare. The figures that you prepare that are part of your thesis or part of published papers. Now there, it's a document. It's going to be read much closer to the uh, surface. Whereas in a presentation, especially if you're talking of on-site presentations, then the lines that you choose to draw your diagrams need to be fairly thick. That be enough pixels need to be filled with color for the impact of that color to be felt. I will again uh, give you an example of how this works in practice. So you see, this is a one point thick line. So you can see for yourself. So I would suggest that if you are using a diagram in a presentation, don't use one point thick line. Two points fine is the minimum, but ideally you should use even thicker lines for your diagram if you are making a presentation. So one point may work. It works, in fact, works very well on uh, for documents that are read closer, but that are documents that are <clears throat> or images that are read far away, this you need to use thicker lines. Even the color contrast, if not many pixels are filled with that color, then it becomes difficult for you to appreciate the differences between colors. That is why you should use thick lines and bold text. That is another requirement. Then we come to the font. Now, many of you would be using Times New Roman. Some of you may, may have switched to Calibri, or you may have uh, you know, some favorite fonts of yours. But remember that Times New Roman, for instance, the very name Times New Roman should tell you that it was actually a font designed for a newspaper, the Times, London. New because then it was new, but then we are talking of 1932. Anyway, so now we have not just text printed on paper in ink. We have pixels on screen. And the screen themselves could be screens that you see in an auditorium. They could be see screens of your desktop. They could be screens of your laptop. They could be screens of your phone. And then it becomes trickier because when you are what they call the real estate, when you are watching a a screen which screen of your cell phone, then the space available is really very limited, which means the number of pixels that are available is smaller. And yet the fonts need to be you know, clear. So that is why. So just to give you an example, here are these five characters. Now you will need to guess that, OK, there could be a 0, there could be O. Numeral one in this font itself is very easy. But then what are the next two? Which is capital I, which is small L. Or are they both capitalized? Are they both small Ls or what? Even if you switch to Times New Roman, so you see the problem. The Times New Roman is good at telling you what is capital I. But which is numeral one and which is lowercase L? So only a guesswork. That's the fourth one is Vardana. And you see, this is a font that is absolutely clear because it uses a slash zero. It uses serifs and angle of the serifs. So it's absolutely clear. Now, in most of the cases, it won't really matter because the context will tell you whether it's numeral one, whether it's capital I, whether it's zero or whether it's O. But if you are showing, for instance, some formulae, if you are showing a URL, or if there are codes where context is not a clue, then you need to be absolutely sure that you are using a font that distinguishes clearly between similar looking characters, because not all fonts work well in this matter. The next thing you need to keep in mind if you want to be easily legible is that avoid using capital letters as a means of emphasis. Capital letters and underlining. 
just don't ever use them for emphasis. Back in the old days where you really, there was very few options available for you to emphasize something, you know, take a typewriter or take a monospace font like courier. How do you emphasize something? You know, you can't change the font. You can't change the color. You can't change the posture. You know, you can't make it italics, for instance. So capital letters were used as emphasis. But now you have so many other variables. So why use capital letters? Avoid them. Underlining too. Why avoid underlining? Because again, earlier it was used when there were few ways of emphasizing. And now underlining probably means an embedded link. So the connotation has changed. So capital letters you should also avoid because they take up more space. And as I said, we already have, we are already strapped for space. We don't have enough space. And this suppress information. What do I mean by suppress information? Take these uh, everyday words. Now remember that PowerPoint is a trademark. The second P is also a capital. So that is what it is. That is how it should be. Whereas by printing this entirely in capital letters, you have masked that information. You have suppressed the information that these and other similar labels use what we call a mixed case or sometimes it's called a camel case. Why camel? Because it has two humps. So P in PowerPoint, C in card, and T in YouTube is also capital. So all the more reason why you should be anti-capitalist. But as I said, it all boils down to reducing the amount of text that you're putting on screen at any one time. Because all this, if it's to be legible, well, you have to give adequate space. Large letters take up more space. So all these recommendations for improving legibility, they are eating up space. So as a rule of thumb, I would say for slides, one plus seven works quite well, maximum. That is, it could be fewer lines. That is, you have one line for the title of the slide and seven lines for the text if your slides are textual, but not more than that. What would you do if your text goes above this? Now, PowerPoint has this nasty uh, default that what it does is once you have defined your slide, then if you are going excess, if your text is excess, it automatically reduces the point size. So avoid that, don't use that option. Likewise, now so far we have been talking about the appearance of your text. We have not said anything about the words that you would choose or how you should choose the text, but that too is important because remember these are slides, which means they are an accompaniment to your presentation. They are supplementing your presentation. They are not substituting for it which means you don't need complete sentences in your slides. Bullet points are fine because you are going to be elaborating on each bullet point. So just phrases, bullet points are fine. You don't require full sentences. Probably I will make two exceptions. One is that if you are giving a quotation, you know, you're quoting somebody else's words, then yes, you know, you can't condense them. Or you are giving a... Uh, definition and which is really important that all the words are there so those might be exceptions but otherwise no you don't need full sentences because as i said uh, the contents of a powerpoint is supplementing it's an audiovisual aid as used to be known earlier which we also means that the words that you choose although being a writer that's a different uh, story altogether but by and large you should use concrete words not abstract words what i mean by that abstract words are typically uh, nouns whereas you make action plain by using verbs so a simple thing like 
if I were to say uh, the temperature went up, well, I mean, of course, it depends on the context, but I would say that is more abstract than saying that the room became hotter. Or instead of saying that germination is slow, germination, that's abstract noun, you say the seeds germinate faster or seeds germinate quickly. So that's about writing. I may touch upon it tomorrow when we talk about writing papers. And whatever text that you choose on the slide should be specific. Again, to give you an example, when I said that make all text large, you know, use a large font, but that is still being general. Now, what is large? Now you may think that 14 point is large. You may think 18 point is large. But what I meant was that it should be somewhere between 28 and above, not smaller than that. So that is why I had to specify. Likewise, I could have said, use generous line spacing. But again, that's that's not being specific. So you need to be precise. You need to be specific. Say, OK, 56 points, one and a half line spacing, whatever. So as I said, it also depends on the context. It also depends on the nature of this presentation. Now, this is a webinar. you know. Uh, so it's fairly informal. I'm not delivering a lecture to uh, you know all stuffed shirts. No, so I could be you know informal, but if you are talking at a very formal meeting, yes, you need to be formal. Just as you would be dressed more formally, the content of your presentation also need to be formal. Now, as far as possible, yes, you should use visuals. Not that I'm using them, but because most of the time the subject matter that I cover are text-based. But in your presentations, you obviously will have greater opportunities to use uh, visuals, you know, charts or models, graphs, whatever. Progressive disclosure is what I've been doing. That is, instead of showing you all bullet points in one go, I'm showing you one point at a time. Again, it's, it's a matter of your choice. There's PowerPoint also offers you another option here, what is called dimming. Dimming, D-I-M-M-I-N-G. Now, if you use the dimming feature of PowerPoint, what it does is all but the last bullet point, all the previous bullet points are rendered gray or subdued, dimmed. So some people use that. They use so that only the point being discussed is very clearly visible. The points that have already been touched upon are dimmed. I personally don't use that because I don't believe that you know you are hanging on to my every word. Maybe you are doing something else. Maybe your attention is distracted. So at least you know what points have been covered. But it's a matter of choice. If you have any handouts, don't distribute the handouts in advance. Keep them with you. And once your presentation is over, then you can give the handouts. If you distribute the handouts in advance, you can be sure that as you begin to speak, most members in the audience will be looking at the handouts and not at you. So don't do that. Again, with two exceptions. One is that if you, if you are, let's say, you are showing how some formula was uh, derived. So you want to take them step by step through a process. So in that case, yes, it might makes more sense to have the handout in front of them as they follow you. But that's uh, an exception rather than a general rule. So if you remember all these legibility requirements, and remember that essentially you need to put less text on the slide, a template is what is you, uh, basically your slides have a template, meaning all your slides within a presentation are structured similarly. That is in terms of their color scheme, in terms of the font, in terms of the bullet points and so on. Let's say that you may have made several presentations and for one particular audience, then you know you have borrowed some slides from presentation A, you have taken some other slide from maybe your colleague, but they are formatted differently. So no, that is not a good idea. Within a presentation, your slides should be consistent. So how much is too much? As I said, one rule of thumb is not more than 49 words on a single slide. Why? Because of this. 
and here i've used a complete sentence because i'm putting a giving you a quotation that's why i've also put quotation marked around it this is a quotation from this source you know you you also see, you are exposed to a lot of advertisements on tv now there is also some legislation about uh, some legal warnings and those of you who smoke you would have seen it's printed on every cigarette pack smoking is injurious to health of course it's printed in a very small small print just as you have what is called fine print the equivalent in tv or radio advertisements is that the text the mandatory text like smoking is injurious to health is read out so fast as to be unintelligible or it is flashed on the screen for such a short time that most people won't get it so that is why advertising standards have a code for that they have a rule now what is that rule the rule defines how long the text should remain on the screen for the mandatory warning to come across so it's based on obviously some data so i'll come to that <clears throat> how much that should be i uh, mentioned to you this feature you know do not auto fit unfortunately that's a default so change that you know don't go in for auto fit if your text is overflowing the text box either you should edit the text so that it is smaller or you go in for more slides what you were thinking of putting on one slide you put it on two slides three slides whatever but whatever you choose to put on one slide should be easily legible so i was talking to you about this uh, mandatory time what is called a hold time that is specified by the advertising standards as to how long the text should remain on the screen so they have a simple formula for that and that is the formula so in part of course is based on number of words five words per second plus there is a 3 second recognition period or a holding time which is common for all the slides so if you follow this formula then this is how it works out to be if you have 50 words on the screen you should allow the audience 13 seconds to read that text now 30 seconds is a pretty long time especially if you are giving a live presentation you know you have the audience in front of you and remember that if you really want them to read then don't go on speaking at the same time just shut up project your slide let them read it in peace and then you start your talk which means that for a full 13 seconds you need to be doing nothing and that's pretty hard to do when you are facing a live audience even i would say in webinar it is pretty awkward people will think that maybe you have lost your connection audio is not working whatever so all the more reason why you should not put too much text on the slide then the images again the images that you would choose or the images that work quite well in um, in a document may not work quite well on a presentation same thing goes for tables you can present a pretty dense table in a document which is meant to be read the reader is controlling the pace but if the same table may not be a good idea to put it on a screen as a presentation even if you do then you will need to highlight the key values maybe you make them bold maybe put them in different color or a box around it and then there is also the question of ratio now earlier i i used to uh, put a take a poll or earlier i could find out from my uh, organizers whether the audience will be using a desktop or a laptop or a phone but now i know most of them will be using a laptop or a phone so i have switched from 3s to 4 ratio for screen that was okay for desktops to 9s to 16 and then the images that you choose should also reflect that ratio so that's about the proportion but it's also the resolution is important that is there is no point in choosing high resolution figures for your presentation so long as the screen is not going to support that resolution unless you have a high definition screen again it's more and more likely that if you are watching it on phone it will be a high definition screen so you can go in for 
high resolution images provided then there's a question of bandwidth but otherwise there is no point in choosing high resolution images because your screen is not going to support it so 72 dpi dots per inch is fairly minimal so so far we have been talking about what you see on screen so people are reading but of course in a presentation most of the time they will be listening to you not so much reading they are listening to you which means that you can't go on speaking at the same speed throughout your presentation without varying it because it will put them to sleep of course there is a natural variation some of us speak tend to speak fast some of us tend to speak slow that is fine that I mean, that's your natural speed but remember that in a presentation you must change your speed of presentation you can slow down because automatically that signals that what you are saying is important you know you are slowing down maybe because it's a very critical definition that you are explaining whereas if you are telling a story if you are telling a joke you can speak faster because you're not expected to follow every word so this is also a cue that you are using for your audience by varying the speed at which you speak but how fast is fast again as i said you need to be specific so you have this uh, XTML standards, the number of words per minute. So they have some criteria. So 80 words per minute is really very slow. 120 words is still slow. Medium is this and fast is really quite fast. So you need to, not only that you need to be a little slower especially if you are in front of an audience which you don't know their composition, especially if you are in an international venue, you don't know, not all may not be, uh, not all have the first language as English or whatever lang language in which you are making the presentation. So again, as a rule of thumb, you know, I don't know how many of you listen to audio books, but audio book readers are typically advised to read at around 150 to 160 words per minute. So that's a, a decent, uh, speed to aim at in fact i would advise you to you know go on to a ted ted website i will um, show you the i mean you are also familiar but i will also give you the url and you will see that different speakers speak at different speeds and they also tend to vary the speeds and the news readers generally tend to speak fast there's a youtube video on this you can listen to it you can take in most of the words but it's really too fast. Then I mentioned to you this website, uh, think out outside the slide, their parodies. So periodically they conduct these uh, surveys. So they conducted this survey last time it was 15, that's still the most recent. And they asked the, the point of this survey was to find out what really annoys uh, viewers. So as you could see, reading the text on the slide that you're projecting is the most annoying thing for your audience you know if you are showing a slide and it has some text on it they're all literate people just let them read why do you have to again start reading first of all there will be always a disconnect because they will be reading at much faster rate St typical reading uh, rate is you know somewhere between uh, around 250 words per minute that is really quite fast so you can't really be speaking that fast so you'll be out of sync so they can neither listen to you nor they can read it in peace likewise full sentences for text that's also annoying legibility yes takes too small to read and too complicated visuals likewise irritating abuses of powerpoint then again you see too much text is always number one or if your slides have errors of grammar spelling punctuation no you need to run a spell check you need to be have your text edited likewise if you like for, as i said uh, you know you are using multiple formats within the same presentation some slides are in one font some slides are another some slides have a different color scheme that means you have thrown it together at the last minute just you know picking slides from here and there no that you are being inconsiderate to your audience Many people ask, you know, how many slides? There is no standard on that. 
it all depends on the content of your slide. For instance, if you are showing a photograph just as a background, well, they don't really need to see it for more than a second. But if you are going to uh, show them a definition or a formula around with de derivation, then yes, that slide needs to be on the screen far longer. So these are PowerPoint things. They're also behavior of the speakers. Again, number one is reading. Or too many interruptions uh, 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 where you keep struggling for your word. That means you are not rehearsed. Not looking at the audience. That's again, and especially, I don't know whether I'm doing it. I hope I am not. But if I'm not, please point that out in uh, chat box. See, I'm seeing this text on my desktop screen. And the webcam is at the top edge of the screen. Most of the time, I keep reminding myself that I should be looking at the webcam and not on my screen. In on-site presentation, it's even more important. You have to look, you have to make eye contact with your audience. You know, don't turn your back to the audience and look at the screen and go on reading the text on the screen. So it's doubly irritating. One, because you're reading the text on the screen. Two, you have turned your back to the audience. No, that is not a good idea. Likewise, some people have some you know, nervous movements. Some people keep on, you know, clicking and unclicking their ballpoint pen. Some have, you know, either a key, some coins, they will keep jingling. Some people will keep pacing across the stage. You know, th these are things that you need to eliminate. Very often, you know, again, this is some people naturally use a lot of gestures. Some people don't use too many gestures. So you be your normal self. If you have done enough homework, if you are well prepared, and if you are really engrossed in, if you're enthusiastic about your presentation, uh, you won't worry about what you need to do on with your hands. And don't lean on the podium or lectern as, as if you need a support, you know, you don't need it. Some postures definitely to be avoided. Now that is too casual. that's too confrontational, you know, as, as though you are challenging the audience. That's not good either. This shows that you are really nervous, that you are being exposed to the gaze of so many speakers. That's not a good idea. You will see this typically in group photos. If there's a group photo, many people you'll find they stand like that. Because of course, it's something that's making them uncomfortable, but you learn to get over it. And remember, you are not on parade ground either. So avoid these. As, as I said, if you are enthusiastic about your presentation, then you won't even assume any of these gestures. Then what you do at the end? How do you handle questions? So I have a few uh, suggestions on that. One is, of course, you need to listen to what question is being asked. At times, it is better to repeat the question so that the audience gets exactly what question you are answering can rephrase it, that's fine. And this also gives you a little more time to think of an answer. But always make it clear what is the question that you are answering before you answer it. So you re rephrase this. And then another thing is, you can't allow just one member of the audience to monopolize this dialogue or monopolize your time. Your time is for all the audience. So if somebody asks you a question, you answer it, then the person starts arguing with you. No, not quite like this, but my experience is different, whatever. Yes, you can sustain our argument for a while, but not it can't go on indefinitely. So after you have answered maybe one or two, three questions at the most, don't keep looking at the question because so long as you are looking at the person, you are signaling that the dialogue can continue. No, so break eye contact. Don't go on answering the same. You can say that, look, we can discuss it later. We can discuss it uh, offline, whatever. Now, also, there is a, uh, I would say, uh, there are two schools of thought about this because I have attended presentations. I've been coached on presenting. I see this there clear dichotomy between the corporate world and the academic world. The academic world, the advice is that 
if you don't know the answer say so say that look you don't know the answer if you can say that okay you look it up you can find it out and you can get in touch by email or whatever whereas the uh, corporate ethic is different the corporate ethics says do not ever admit that you don't know the question instead try to answer a different question try to rephrase a question be vague about it so it's it's your call so as i said successful presentations are based on lot of planning preparation and practice so just to reiterate you need to visit the venue in advance take a now for instance why do i say moisten your throat see when you are when you are nervous then your mouth dries up and which means that even your normal voice becomes a poorer voice because the resonance is subdued the vocal cords if the vocal cords are dry then they don't resonate well likewise the vocal cords are short they are tightened because that's another uh, reflex when you are nervous the vocal cords tighten so all the more reason why you need to be well prepared especially your opening lines and closing lines because the opening lines that is where you are the most nervous and that's where your audience is still getting used to you so you need to know exactly how you are going to start have it pat you know check the first two or three lines you should have it absolutely off your bat quickly so these are some of the things that you need to keep in mind now especially in a panel discussion that's why my uh, last bullet point here that although you have been given time maybe 7 minutes 10 minutes 15 whatever but typically what and i'm sure you have also observed this that in a conference the speakers who speak first or early on the chair persons are little reluctant to enforce the time limit so they typically end up taking more time nobody asks them to shut up and then it's your turn and the chair person turns to you and says uh, look i know we said you have 10 minutes but you know can you possibly make it in 5 or 6 minutes you know lunch is waiting or whatever so in that case your solution is not to rush through all your slides and speak faster and faster no at least mentally you should have plan b okay if i am really pressed for time these are the slides that i will show not all of them and be done with it now i mentioned to you about fonts because some corporate settings you are required to use certain fonts that are used for branding of your company in that case powerpoint gives you an option although of course it comes at the cost of file size file size increases but if you are taking your presentation say on a usb drive then better to and if you have used fonts that are not commonly available then see like i have been using sitka text sitka text is a system font on windows 8.1 onwards but before that no it's not embedded font and as before before i end uh, here are some uh, recommended resources so these are all i i started with a quote from uh, olivia simons her website speaking about presenting that's really a good website ted.com it's the gold mine of i'm sure some of you are already familiar with it you can see all sorts of speakers and how committed they are but let me mention just two things about ted one is that no ted talk can exceed 20 minutes this is an absolute non negotiable rule for no matter what is the stature of the speaker second rule about ted is no speaker is allowed to speak at ted unless he or she has rehearsed the presentation with the organizers again no matter how veteran speaker you are you have to rehearse you have to rehearse your presentation with ted organizers but as i said it's a gold mine also all the talks are accompanied by transcripts so uh, accent is not a problem for you and you can see how people speak how fast how slow how they vary their uh, speed and so on and it's searchable remind so you know you can go on to ted website whatever topic of interest to you you can search for it 
and a number of books are also his this is the most recent how to present science concisely because as as time passes you the time available for a speech i see distinctly for the last 15 years i've seen it keeps coming down so all the more reason why you need to be more concise uh, talk like ted uh, what carmen gallo has done is he has chosen uh, to interview and study the speak speeches of most successful speakers either most downloaded or most viewed and he has compiled a list of these uh, nine they're not really secrets i would say that but that is something that is common to all the successful ted speakers speakers whose views uh, run to millions and this is by chris anderson who uh, as it says head of ted so that's also a good uh, source of information uh, these are all by nancy duarte who is a presentation coach she has she coaches you know fortune 500 ceos heads of nations whatever so she has put her lessons in these books then there are michael alice's for instance geared at more uh, scientific and technical presentations walworks focuses on language so language for speeches designing slides so these are all i would say a good resources for you to read increasingly there are also good textbooks available on how to present online so because there are different platforms now zoom i find of course most familiar quite convenient but there are other for instance many of the other meetings i participate they use uh, microsoft meetings which means i can't use firefox it's easier to use edge or some are chrome specific and so on so so these are some good resources so i want to end with a quote from nancy duarte and then if you have questions as i said i will stop sharing and as before i'll be happy to send you a copy in pdf of this presentation i have put my uh, email id at the in the chat box so i'll st stop sharing at this point and it's uh, over to you Uh, guys the floor is open for the questions if you have any doubts you can ask sir you said uh, the method how not to stand in the presentation but how to stand like how to behave in like oh in fact as... allowed to uh, walk in between like if we want to cover the whole podium so can we do that uh, i would say it is actually distracting i mean why do you want to keep you know pacing across well there are some presenters who walk but they enter the space of the audience if you want to do that that's fine i mean you have a lapel mic and you can move among your audience but simply to pace left to right right to left like a caged tiger it's distressing and about how to stand as i said if you are really involved in your talk you won't even be conscious of you know that whether how you should stand and how you should not stand but as i said that's why i showed some postures that you should avoid what comes to you naturally that is what you need to do and that's why if you are prepared well you will be less nervous because some of these postures especially i gestured this you know this is it clearly shows that you are nervous so if you are well prepared if you have rehearsed you won't be nervous and then you won't be conscious of your body language so whatever is natural will come to you Uh, sir i have a question uh, mm -hmm. being a phd student we are often asked to uh, put the reference of the literature to cite the reference so like what should be the correct placement of uh, writing uh, reference in slides because if we put it in the slide it unnecessarily occupies the space absolutely And so yeah. ideally what you need to do is yes. the source it should be at the bottom of your slide and somewhere between 14 to 18 points is more than enough because they are not really meant to be understood they are more as a reference and if possible you can include a link so it becomes all the more uh, 
uh, you don't have to be tied down to a very large font. So two things. One is put them at the bottom of the slide and put in a smaller font. It, it doesn't matter that they don't have to read it in full while you are still presenting. Or you can gather all of them together in a towards the end as a sources and then you can put those. But you're yes. right, you cannot give that much prominence to a reference or a source. Yes, sir. So second question is, uh, sec uh, so second question is like, what if we want to club together the figures and uh, probably one or two sentences in the same slide or table and two and three sentences? So is it a good idea? Yeah, you could use animation. So what you could do is just use simple uh, uh, animation that is simple uh, option is appear after click. So okay. what you could do is first show the table. So that time the text is not seen to the audience. So you can maybe talk about it and then you click again and the text will appear on the slide. So use animation. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Not at all. Uh, sir, uh, yeah? you had told about uh, halting for a few seconds after a slide or before the slide. Like, so like, when is it better? Is it like, uh, uh, see, or... that, no, no, it is typically after that is once you are slide, once the slide that you want to show is on the screen is visible to the audience. And especially if it's a slide full of text, then mm -hmm. that is where you should just need to be quiet. Okay. Allowing okay. the audience enough peace to read it by themselves. Okay. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, sir, actually, uh, after uh, seeing the uh, basic necessary things uh, in giving a presentation, I just could conclude that three parts uh, we have to prepare the presentation with. One is the content, second was the conduct, third was the cosmetics, sir, I think. So oh, three Cs. Maybe, <laughs> okay. uh, maybe other uh, Cs also we can you know put on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. may I request that if sometimes we have been given a, a, a very uh, quick presentation to be given for any audience, like we're given mm -hmm. a time for a, a week or so, so how much time should we give equally? Uh, shall we give equally or shall we just give some kind of a percentage to the content, conduct and cosmetics part? So you can please give some just vague idea to us. Yeah, I will mention a couple of points. One is that in fact, there's inverse relationship. That is the smaller time you have for presentation, the longer you need to spend preparing because you have then to really focus on the most essential thing that you want to present in the limited time that's available. So actually it's more difficult. So that is one thing you need to do. Second thing is you also be, need to be very careful about the scope of your presentation. You know, I, earlier when I used to take this uh, as a uh, regular course and I still do in some uh, institutions. So I would have this that every uh, participant will be given seven minutes to make a presentation. And I will tell them, look, you have seven minutes. When I, when I say seven minutes are up, just stop whatever you are saying, stop mid sentence and leave. Now the most often, the, the most common mistake was that, and when they exited their time was they were too ambitious in the scope of their presentation. That they chose a topic that could not have been covered in seven minutes. So you have to be ruthless in focusing on the topic. The smaller, uh, the shorter time you have, the more precisely you need to say that I'm going to cover only this. That was one thing. And as I said, one is the inverse relation. Second thing is, uh, if you just send me an email, I can send you a link. There is, I think there's some, I forget the exact uh, name of the competition, but I'll send you a link that the audience, uh, the speakers are only allowed, I think uh, one or two minutes, something really very short. So you could see some of those presentations that you'll give, also get an idea of how you, what you really need to do if the time is very short. Uh, sir, we have a question in the chat box, like mm -hmm. how we can embed figures and images in slide with variable size and resolution and aligning them without uh, getting them blurred. Now, blurring happens, especially if you enlarge, if the original resolution, the, the whatever source that you have, if the slides, because typically you have figures which are, uh, you know, uh, typically JPEG figures. Now, JPEG is a compressed format which means that already the, uh, the data have been compressed, which means, and if you enlarge it, the pixelation then becomes obvious. So first uh, rule is never enlarge the figures. In fact, you can 
decrease them, reduce them, they will become slightly sharper. So that's one thing. Then embedding the figures in slide, the other thing is resolution, which I have mentioned, then the uh, file format. So for instance, EPS or uh, TTF, these will be really uh, very large, uh, large files. You need to use only compressed format. Okay, sir. And uh, I guess one yeah. last, as uh, sir, you mentioned that in order to emphasize the things, we should not focus on the underlining and the highlighting in the capitalize the first uh, letter of the word. So what should we follow to emphasize a particular thing in the well, presentation? Let's say that you have a few lines of text and you want to emphasize one or two words. One is you can put them in a different color or you can make them bold or you can increase the font size only for that particular word. So there are several options. Okay, sir. Uh, I, uh, we don't have uh, any queries. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I have one more question. Can yeah, I ask? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk, sir. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, these competitions are three minute thesis competitions, maybe. Ah, right. right. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, exactly. About to ask that, like, yes, yes. You, That's do you the have one. any, huh, yeah, do you have any thoughts like, how, what should be the idea to present these kind of talks? No, in fact, many of those talks are available for you to watch. You can just Google for three minute thesis and then you can see. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. That That's the one I had in mind. Okay, sir. Thank you so, so much. So I have one question if you mm -hmm. just give me a chance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it a good idea to involve videos? And if so, so uh, should it be at the last or wherever it is, uh, the correct placement is? Yeah, wherever it's most appropriate. That is one thing. Secondly, also remember that it increases the file size quite a bit and it may or may not play depending on the system. That's why all the more reason why you should actually test the video. Now you see what happens actually in this presentation, when I present this, uh, uh, that is uh, offsite, uh, sorry, <laughs> onsite, that is a live presentation. What I do is I also uh, have audio clips, which I embed in my presentation to show how it sounds that people speaking at different speeds, you know, slow, fast, very fast, and so on. But you see, the problem is if I embed them and I'm only sharing the screen, so the audio part doesn't get shared easily. So I need to figure out a way. Sometimes there's time, then what I do is I copy them separately and then play them and so on. Yes, so there are things that you need to check. But yes, it is a very good idea to include video because that captures the attention like nothing else can. Okay. But you also need to be sure that technically you would be able to do it. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Most welcome. Uh, sir, I have yeah. one. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so suppose that I'm, I'm presenting uh, in a live setting where I have mm -hmm. my own own device uh, on That's the great. podium. I have mm -hmm. a screen on the back and I mm -hmm. need to refer to the slide. Like I need to know what point is on the slide. What is a better way to look at the screen uh, at the back or the laptop? No, sorry. Uh, can you... Uh... Tell me again, what's the question? In a live setting, I have huh? a screen where the presentation is at the back of my, in my back, like the big <laughs> screen. Huh. And, then I, and then I have my own laptop screen from where it is being shown. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, for certain point on the slide, I need to just see what point it is on. Okay. Mm -hmm. so where okay. my eye should be? Like, should I go, turn back and look at the uh, big screen or should I look at my laptop screen? Uh, to no, since, no, since you are obviously you are referring to some slide which you are not ready to show yet, that's what you are getting at, right? It no, is the, suppose I have or, five or another presentation. Maybe if you want to refer to something else. No, then obviously you will need to look at uh, your laptop because from no, where no. you need to see that information. Yes. No, 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 sir. I'm not saying about other presentations. And suppose okay. that I have five points which which are there on the screen, like which comes up one by one. Now the third okay. point came up. I need oh. to. Just referred that which point. It okay. Is. Okay. At that oh, time, oh, okay. I, 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 I got it. Then in fact, the best solution is that the slide, which has all the five points, you mm -hmm. show it multiple times. Okay. You okay. repeat that slide after, you know, every elaboration. That's the best way. Okay. Sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And in that slide, what you could do, let's say, as you say, you have five points and you are going to be talking about each five point. So your first slide, before you start this series, we'll show all the five points 
and all the five points will be uniformly uh, uniform in appearance. Then you deal with the first point and maybe it takes quite a while. That's why you want to show uh, the slide again. Then when you show this, uh, the slide the second time, the first point which you have already covered should be dimmed or should be less prominent. Okay, sir. Got it. Right. Okay, sir. Uh, do we have any more queries? Oh, sorry, I have overstepped your time. That's... No, that's not an issue. Sir. Okay. So I guess uh, we don't have uh, any more queries now, sir. Right. I would like to thank... I have one more question. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Can I ask? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, it's like if you have figures, so uh, let's say I have a figure to show and it's a simulation plot. So okay. should I write something about it or should I just say about it? So it's the result of the simulation that you want to project. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So ideally, what you need to do is you show the results of the simulation. Of course, that will be a visual. That has to be a slide. Yes, sir. But how you ran the simulation or what were your assumptions or what were your other constraining factors, you can talk about them. Maybe you can have a text slide before saying what is it that you varied or how the simulations uh, were, uh, were run. Mm -hmm. So simulation have, set up something like that yeah right? yeah yeah exactly before ah, that yeah. and then you can show them the results of the simulation that's it yeah okay thank yeah. you so much sir. so uh, no more queries will be entertained now okay. uh, I, sir, and all the participants will all meet tomorrow uh, at the same time and we were having two sessions session three is related with the handling citation and references and session four is related with publishing papers in high impact journals so sure. guys if have any more queries we'll entertain them tomorrow tomorrow thank you so sir. the meeting and link will remain the same all right okay i'll keep that in mind all right then bye bye take care Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. And if you have any questions, you have my email ID. So you're most welcome. Thank you. Sure, sir.